Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Cannon is Ed Walker, who spent 10 years working in war zones and is now the director of Hope Into Action. Ed Walker, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you, it's great, it's an honour to be here, thank you. Well, I've read your books, Ed, and I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. You graduate from university and you join Tear Fund and end up in Burundi. Tell us about how did that happen? Yeah, well, I, um, well, I left university with no idea what to do, but I, I had once said a prayer, Lord, you know, I'll go anywhere for you. You know, I'd love, I'd love. This is what I'd love to do, but I suspect it's past now because I've got to get a graduate job. And then a friend said, "Ed, I studied geography. The thing I loved about geography was always overseas development, people and places." And I said, "Well, there's this Tier Fund disaster response team. You can just get on the register, and then they'll call you up to anywhere, short term placement." And I was like, "Disaster isn't my thing. I'm all about the long term." And anyway, I got on the register. Uh, Kosovo crisis broke. All their good staff went to Kosovo. They were utterly desperate and they needed, you know, I couldn't speak French. It's a French speaking country. So they called me up and uh, they said, do you speak French? I said, no. And they say, have you got a passport? I said, yes, okay, you're in. It was kind of how it went. Um, yeah. There were, there, I like that. There's, there was a need and there was someone who was available. That was kind of about it. That's um, it. Tell, now tell us what, what does Tier Fund do? Well, Tier Fund is an international uh, relief organisation that predominantly works through the church to alleviate the poverty in its community. So it believes that the church is the best place to alleviate uh, physical, emotional and spiritual poverty. Uh, but it will, in very extreme in disasters, send out uh, staff where, where the need exceeds that of the, the capacity of the local church. And that it's got what's called a disaster management team. I was part of that disaster response or management team and ended up after Brunei spending nine and a half, ten years in disasters all in Africa. So I went from Brunei to South Sudan to northern Kenya in the deserts, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, back to South Sudan and then Darfur, uh, by which stage I was married. And that and yeah, that was ten years really just bouncing years. around all these disasters. Okay, tell us some give us an insight into the ten years that you were part of this tier fund team. What kind of situations did you work in and what did you see? Yeah, you work in very extreme environments. So physically very extreme, extreme heat, uh, extreme weather conditions, extreme uh, dust storms. Uh, and you are living sometimes in tents, in mud huts, uh, a long way from home, sometimes with only you know no phones because they're banned from the local government. The government don't allow you to have phones, so you're on a HF radio. So you're incredibly isolated. Um, the only way of getting any sort of messages is when the plane lands. Uh, it can be, it was at times extremely dangerous. Uh, Darfur was probably one of the most dangerous operating environments in the world at the time we were there. And so over the the the, uh, the 10 years, you probably experienced vir virtually every manifestation of war, either directly or, or vicariously through your staff or your teams or your colleagues that you're working with, with the exception of sort of chemical and biological weapons. Uh, and of so course, you saw war up close in, in, in the sense that you saw the effects of war on people groups. That's it. The, ma the main way you'd see it is not is the impact of war on people groups. So huge number of displaced people, uh, camps, destruction of villages, uh, towns obliterated, uh, wells destroyed, uh, but mainly dealing with war affected populations, extreme hunger. Uh, destitution uh, and so forth and trying to work with those people to, to alleviate their poverty and adapt to their new environments. So uh, you saw it on a massive scale. How did you cope personally, emotionally and psychologically? Yeah, I think that's probably the hardest thing as a, as a Christian. Uh, it, it's really hard to, uh, to, to deal with all these things, whoever you are. If you believe in a loving God and you're faced with awful uh, d suffering, 
How do you reconcile those things? That, that, that it's the age old question that Job asked, but you have to ask it afresh for yourself as a, as a Christian. I, I found my Christian upbringing had ill-equipped my faith to deal with it, uh, but I found the Bible was a source of, when I began to read it, in particular the kind of suffering Psalms and the complaints and the anguishes in the Psalms and Habakkuk and all those kind of, the, I found the Bible equipped me where my upbringing perhaps hadn't. So obviously, Ed, you, you, you saw people starving, uh, dealing with all the, the horrible things that we think about when we think of war. How did you personally cope with that? Yeah, it, I can remember one time just walking around one of our feeding centres, seeing all these skin and bones, literally skin and bones, the worst the worst sights of humanity. Death felt like it was stalking every single person, every single mother with their child, every single child in there. And it was sort of 6 a.m. in the morning. We'd prayed for two children. They both died overnight. The nurses were there looking after them. And just, yeah, just going for a shower, a uh, bucket shower, and weeping. Uh, and as I weeped, I began thinking, well, what's my emotion here? And why, why is this one getting to me this time? But it was real anger. And it was anger that, um, yeah, as is happening, for, for the want of two meals a day, people are starving to death in this day and age. So it was a, an anger towards evil and injustice. Yeah, it was. And it wasn't directed at anyone. It was this, uh, 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 but I, I realised also anger is a natural outflowing of your love. If you care for hum humans, if you care for your fe fellow brother and sister and you see them suffering, you're going to be angry. And so you can't love your human brother or sister and not be angry when they go through such awful suffering for want of such basic medicine or, or, uh, or food. And I began to understand in a sense, well, of course, God, if he's loved us, is going to be angry when bad things happen. Um, so, yeah, and that was just an example. One example, I suppose, you, you go through those emotions, you take them to God, and you come out stronger, you come out fighting. Absolutely. You tell your story in this very gripping book, Scorched Earth. Uh, I found it just so gripping. Ed, and um, there's a chapter in there that really gripped me about why why do people kill people? Mm. Uh, fascinating that you included a chapter like that in the book. What prompted you to write about that? I think it's one of the things you just find yourself thinking about. What? Why? How could I kill someone? How could I get a gun in it? Often it's the disaffected populations in, in a society, the young people that haven't got education, before they know it, they've been scooped up, they've been conscripted, they've been sold the glories of war. Uh, war fills a void that's within them, and before they know it, they're victims of their own killing because they've shot someone, they've been behind a gun, they've been uh, duped into the battlefield, and then they've got to live with the trauma and the guilt with that as well. And so, yeah, suddenly you find yourself thinking, OK, maybe these aren't bad guys and good guys. Maybe we're all part of a system. Um, and that's you, you begin to if you when you understand, it's easy to forgive. I think when you've met some of these young guys who are on the bad side and you look into their eyes and you realize, man, they've suffered, too. Um, then then somehow, you know, it's the forces, isn't it, behind it that you're you're angry against. Absolutely. Ed, as we're speaking today, it's 12 days since the invasion in Ukraine. What's your take on what's happening? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it's a, the scale of this disaster is extreme. Uh, when you work in a number of disasters, you end up sort of, sub, you, you calibrate the disaster and to have over a million refugees within one week or within 10 days makes this a very, very extreme disaster. So we are right to feel powerful emotions about it. We are, white, we are right to want to respond. Um, and so how can we respond? I think I would say two things. I would say give your money to organisations and know what they're doing because to um, receive a million people uh, is a big job and there are, there'll be professional organisations going out there and doing it. Uh, I would say pray like Bilio, uh, pray for the Russians, pray for the Ukrainians, pray for the leaders there. And I think also I would encourage us to start thinking now about the refugees that are coming to our shores and will continue to come to our shores, not just from Ukraine, but from all the conflicts. 
how can our church respond to them as they come through? How can we give them a home, a safe place, uh, a haven, a sanctuary? Uh, and th- those would be my th- three things. So how can we, how can the ch- church respond to those that come to our shores? Well, I think the government, what the government needs to put in place a system of how we can do it. At the moment, the government has, hasn't worked it out. But I would think uh, many of them are going to need houses. Uh, can Have you got spare rooms you can put them up in? Have you got spare vicarages for spare manses? Uh, have you got uh, enough investment capital to buy a house? Uh, we we would in, we'd encourage you to think about all those things and at our conference on the 29th of March we're going to we're going to be talking about just this how in practical terms can you help uh, any refugee coming to our borders uh, so th- those would be the things I'd, I'd encourage people to really start thinking about if you want to help people need a home uh, there are still hundreds of afghans from last august in hotels in this country because no one's given them a home um, so it's really important we think how can we you, you can't you can't lay down roots you can't invest in your future if you're rattling around in a, inadequate accommodation so really it, it's responding like a good samaritan picking up on the teaching that jesus presented to us for sure and going out of your way and uh, seeing these people as your brother and your sister i think that's just vital uh, and being intelligent about how you do it, being thoughtful, uh, listening, speaking to professionals around you, uh, speaking to your local council, offering to help. I've got a spare room. I've got a spare manse. I've got some capital. How can I help? Why do you think we're reluctant to help? Is it because we're under, you know, we feel someone else is going to respond or it's going to inconvenience us to do that and maybe I'll just give my money? Yeah, I think... Uh, giving money is a good thing to do. Um, uh, you know, let's be clear about that. Prayer, I believe, is a bedrock to all things. God will speak to our hearts in prayer if we if we if we get on our knees and pray about it, and God will then fill us with a compassion, and it's the compassion that will drive us. So, ultimately, if we're reluctant to to respond for whatever reason, I'd say get on your knees, pray, pick up the Old Testament, pick up the Psalms, pick up the words of Jesus, and you will find God's heart sinking with your heart, and you'll rise from your knees determined to do something and that something may be more prayer maybe I'm going to gather a prayer meeting for my church yes. that's great if that's what the outcome is that's fantastic but I do believe prayer drives action because God's heart will sink with ours and it will go into action you can't quite get your head round people having to run away from their homes to survive um and the, and the situation is escalating. As you ponder on what's happening, what do you think is going to end up happening? Uh, well, I, th- I think for the one individual, we, we are housing someone who fled Ukraine aged 15, uh, 23 years ago. The cost and the emotional impact on that one person is so significant that 23 years ago, he's in one of our homes, um, he's been homeless, we asked him about it and he broke down in tears because it was so triggering of the trauma he went through 23 years ago. So I think even the impact on that one person that's had to separate themselves at 14 from their mother and father, leave their mother and father, cross the border by themselves, not knowing where they're going to end up, maybe with a little sister in tow, that is a lifelong trauma that they will suffer. And you times that by a million, families separated, uh, husbands worried about wives, wives worried, worried about husbands. You cannot compute the impact already this war has had on millions and millions of people. And yeah, we have to do something about it. We have to provide people with safety, routine, warmth, love. That is how you overcome trauma. That is how you overcome. That's how you reconcile yourself to all the, 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 the loss, the grief, the pain that they've already gone through. Um, it has to be warmth, it has to be acceptance, it has to be a sense of belonging, it has to be help. You spent 10 years working in five war zones. It was time to come back to England. Mm. You ended up in Peterborough. How did that happen? Well, um, I gave nine months notice. Uh, Rach, my wife and I, we, we felt sort of a sense it was time to leave. We had two children. Um, we wanted to be, I wanted to be around more for my children. So we gave nine months notice. I applied for any job I could find in England and I, f- I got one in. The first one I got was in Peterborough. So I ended up in Peterborough. Uh, working with? Uh, it was working with 
uh, and I was working in a homeless organisation, running some hostels, and what struck me immediately was uh, having worked in an organisation that believed the church was the way to alleviate poverty. Here I was in Peterborough, and I met a homeless man. He was on the street. He had and no... I like that. That's when you were with your daughter in the, in the park, just playing with your daughter, but you saw this homeless man. That's right. Don't make it sound too glamorous. I was slightly bored because I'd done a lot of playtime with her. I'm, I met a man on the bench. I asked him his story. His story is the same story you hit, that still happens thousands of times every year in this country. He left prison that morning. He had nowhere to go and no one to go to. By 11 a.m. when I met him, he was halfway through a bottle of something. He'd spent his money you get from the prison release on that. I could find nowhere for him. No, nowhere. So on that, Ed, so he leaves prison that morning. He's got nowhere to go. That's quite difficult for many of us to grasp that he had no family, no friends, no one was willing to help him in his world. And that's a de yes, and that's a depth of loneliness most of us can't relate to. If you've got no one to go to, that is a crippling loneliness. And it's a relational poverty that I certainly couldn't relate no. to. Because so he comes out of prison and there's no one there to meet him? No. And, if, uh, and the people that do meet him tend to be people that want to sell him drugs or, uh, you know, whatever. And that's not healthy either. And I just assumed the system in a highly developed country like this would have solved this problem. Uh, the truth is they haven't. And the people, as they come out the gate, are vulnerable and homeless thousands of times every year in this country. And what struck me when I met this man, A, I couldn't find anywhere for him to go, and B, there wasn't a single church in that city that was giving the homeless a home. So, uh, so you tried several hostels to get the man in, but because he'd come out of prison, that was one excuse why they couldn't house him. That's right. They couldn't take him. He was too old. They don't take ex-offenders. And uh, I, So there was nowhere for him? There was nowhere for him. So I had to leave him there. I had nowhere I could find him. I tried other cities, none would take him. I said, he'd come from Cambridge. I said, why don't you go back to Cambridge? He said, if I go back to Cambridge, I'll be surrounded by the same old people doing the same old things, and I will end up, what will happen is I'll end up back inside in three months' time. So he made actually a rational choice. His only friend was a bottle, and he had nowhere else to go, so he stayed on the bench. Because that kind of gave him some comfort. Exactly. It was a friend for him. He was there for him. And, yeah, as I reflected on his story, I thought, you know, an evangelist would come along and say, you need Jesus. Uh, someone from a drink organisation would say, you need to give up the bottle. Probation would say, you need to stop your crime. Uh, someone else would say, you need food. Someone else would say, you need some shelter. And what we at Hope Into Action tried to do, what I wanted to try and do, is, is try, to re try to break every yoke, to quote Isaiah. Um, so when I came back from this, from, my, you know, Darfur, my favourite verses there were Isaiah 58, isn't this the kind of worship I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice, set the oppressed free, uh, to provide the poor wanderer a shelter, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, all of which had made perfect sense to me in my environment in Darfur and Sudan. And I couldldn't work out how they applied to me in Peterborough. And I kept saying, well, Lord, what, 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 what's the, how do these verses apply? And I believe God led me to that man. And he said, this is the poor wanderer. And actually, even in this country, these verses do apply. And that was news to me. I hadn't sort of realised that. I'd assumed that this was covered. No, it isn't. And it still isn't. Um, and but, that's that, a... but that encounter with that man with your daughter mm. prompted you to pioneer a new ministry that's in right. response to this situation. Yes. So how, how did God lead you into birthing a new ministry well, I thought about it for a long time. I prayed about it a long time. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to carry on in the normal career thing. Uh, my wife and I also had, had an inheritance of £30,000. So That we, was from your aunt? That was from my aunt, uh, who didn't have any children. So we bought a house with it. I went into prison. I met someone who had nowhere to go on release. I met him at the gate. Uh, rather so than how it, did you f connect with him? Uh, through prison chaplaincy, yeah. and they arranged a meeting with me. It was a it was a powerful meeting because, as is often the case when you meet someone in prison, you're actually meeting Jesus. Jesus spoke to me. I can still remember some of the things he said to me. I can still remember how God spoke to me. I believe, not just through that meeting, but many other prisoners I've since met. Okay, just recap so we've got this straight. Okay, so you buy the house, you've got the house, but you then speak to your church. Yes. Because you realise that without the church and without people supporting and serving, you're not going to be able to run this. 
Exactly. And are they volunteers? The church provide agreed to provide volunteers, and it's twofold. It's it's a recognition that uh, so we we match a house with a church with a professional worker to knit it all together. We so if all we did was provide a really good home and a professional, there's something limited there. You're not meeting the deeper relational needs. But we don't want. Uh, we want to make sure everything we do is quality. We don't want to be Christians high on passion, low on skill, Christian Muppets going around doing bad jobs. So we include a professional in every house we open to make sure there is a quality, a seam of quality going through all we do. And that combination of a really good home, a strong uh, relational input and professional input makes us unique. And we've won various awards over the years for that model. Um, I know the, the Guardian, for example, gave you an award. The Guardian newspaper, a left-wing sort of, I would think, quite a secular thinking organisation, recognised that with the church at the heart of what we do, it's it's they classed us in 2017 as the best housing project in the country. Uh, unashamed of our faith, the quality of our work shines through uh, bec because it should, because it's on a bedrock of prayer. But critically for us. Uh, our, our model of outreach is based on Luke 4. Uh, Jesus said, the, anointed Lord is, the Spirit of the anointed Lord is upon me to release the oppressed and proclaim the good news. And if we want to follow Jesus, those two things need to be held always at the centre of our outreach. So releasing oppression isn't about giving things to poor people. That's part of it. It's trying to get them out of their situation. And we never want to lose that 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 edge where he says, you know, Jesus Christ can do amazing things, amazing things in your life as well. So you've moved from that one house, how many houses do you now oversee? There are now 97 houses in partnerships with churches. With churches? In this country, and we have 33 in the pipeline, which means we've got, uh, we're managing 130 houses at the moment. Every single one of those in partnership with a church. So we have over 100 churches now giving the homeless a home, but critically they're giving them a home with love at the centre of it. And there's desperate need. For sure, there's desperate need. Yeah. There's loads of need. I can so tell you're you not going to stop there? No, no, the need is uh, there are so many people that could do with a home, just like that guy that came out of prison. There are women fleeing domestic violence. There are people on the streets, people sleeping in tents in December. I met him just the other week. He was in a dis tent in December on the 13th of... Um, December last year. Cold. Cold, miserable. It's just miserable. It's a miserable existence, isn't it? You can't sleep, there's a stone under you, you just feel awful about yourself, your self-esteem is rock bottom. You come into our house, we think you are worth this. We're going to give you a really nice house because we think you're, we, you are worth it. And that helps their sense of And they're of loved, they're encouraged, they're clothed, they're fed. Yeah, we, we, we'll provide them with food, but we'll encourage them to use their money, benefits, or, or if they've got a job, to budget well so they can be empowered to live, uh, you know, look after themselves. And then hopefully they'll move on from there. That's right. Into independent living. That's right, yeah. And we, uh, our dream is then for the church to still be in relationship with them, still be in touch with them. Um, but it's a sense of holistic growth that we want to see so that they can flourish into what God has created them to be. Uh, no one, when God is born, no one is born a prostitute or an addict or anything like that. And if that has happened to them, something tragic has happened in the meantime for them to end up in those situations. And yeah, we're, we're there to try to put them back on the, the right course of their life. And with the, believing that the church can do it, believing the church has the social power, the spiritual power, the financial power to be a real force for change. So 100 houses is amazing, yes, but there are 50,000 churches and there are thousands and thousands more homeless men and women. So we are unbelievably pleased about what God has done for these yes. 100 houses. We're blown away. Every house that opens, I'm, I'm, my chin drops on the hits the floor. Still, I'm so excited and pleased about it. And at the same time, the, the sky is the limit, you know, why, why can't every church do this? Um, I know. So the potential is if 50,000 churches each having one house at least. Well, yeah. And why not? Because um, if you did that, we'd make a, a real impact, a very, very significant impact. And you then could get the churches back in the centre of caring for the homeless in this country. And they, they, they've got something, objectively speaking, they've got something multi-million pound housing charities can't provide. And that is 
uh, social, they've got the social capital of a standing community, trained in loving their neighbour. And obviously as Christians we believe they've got a spiritual power and a spiritual um, uh, transformational power that they can bring. But even if you don't believe in that, the social capital that they bring uh, to a secular objective mind is really powerful and is good news. There's needed everywhere, whether you're in Africa, Ukraine, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, I mean, everywhere there is need. For sure there is. And we're just told to love our neighbour, to get on their knees. God will lead us to that knees, uh, need. God's heart, you know, God's heart is for... The penultimate thing Jesus said on the cross was, John, will you please look after my mother? And the first thing the Mason Church did was take in a vulnerable lady and they took her into the home. The first thing John, representative of the church, did was to house the homeless. That's so beautiful. I love the title of your book, A House Built on Love. And uh, that's what you've been endeavouring to do with your first hundred houses. Uh, a house built on love. Uh, that, that's beautiful. Uh, it really is uh, very moving to hear a little of your story. Your hope then, Ed, for the future? I, I'd love for churches for it to become normal for, uh, you walk into a church now, you expect to find an alpha, expect to find a, a band. Uh, I'd love it to be normal that in 10, 20 years time you walk into a church and you expect them to have a house for the vulnerable in one shape or form. And you expect people to be worshiping God by mentoring someone who's on the edge of society. And the church will become richer when it engages with the poor because the poor will provide, the, the poor make the party, you know, and we, they will enrich us, the church. God will go, grow us through the poor. He will speak to us through the poor when it becomes normal for us as part of our worship to be engaging with a vulnerable adult or a young person or anyone who is in a vulnerable situation. So, Ed, any church leader now listening to what you've just said, there's a need in their community, in their parish, with homeless people of all kinds. What would you say to them? Look up our website, www.hopeintoaction.org.uk. Send us an email and we'll respond. We would love to chat with you. We'd love, we exist to enable your church to house the homeless in your community. And we would love to have a conversation with you about how to do that. Ed, you're, you're an inspiration. Pray that the Lord will continue to bless you and your wife, your family, and your team. And uh, keep on keeping on. Thank you, Ed, for joining us I appreciate on Facing it. the Canon. Thank you. Wow, I, I'm truly inspired. A house built on love. Yes, we can do this. We can build houses uh, for Jesus, in the name of Jesus, uh, to respond to the needs in our community. Let's pray for the Lord's sovereign reign and rule in all war-torn countries of the world, and particularly Ukraine. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again. Thank you.